We have a lot to cover today. So at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator and our panelist, uh, Dr. Patrick Stiff from the Cardinal Bernardine Cancer Center at Loyola. Dr. Stiff is the chair of the Foundation's Medical Advisory Board and has been a tremendous partner, advisor, and supporter of the Foundation. Dr. Stiff will introduce our experts on our panel. So over to you, Dr. Stiff. Good afternoon, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Carrie, and I hope everybody can hear me. It's, uh, it's a real treat to, uh, again, um, moderate the uh, town hall meeting, and we certainly um, are looking forward to helping uh, clear the air with some of these amazing questions, quite frankly. Um, we have, um, in addition to myself, uh, Dr. J.S. Mehta, who's uh, the Ches Family Professor of Myeloma Research and Professor of Medicine uh, at Northwestern University Medical Center. His practice uh, area of an intense focus is multiple myeloma. However, he's a, um, a true um, uh, hematologist that, that is an expert in all sorts of uh, areas of, um, of blood cancers, including myelodysplastic syndromes, transplantation, uh, leukemias and lymphomas. Um, again, his uh, uh, main focus is on multiple myeloma. We have a lot of questions for myeloma, so uh, you, you will get uh, truly uh, uh, excellent answers to your questions. Next is Sonali Smith. Uh, she is the chief of the section of hematology oncology at University of Chicago and the Elwood Jensen Professor of Medicine, and she focuses mostly in uh, lymphomas, Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, she has an interest in uh, new agents, which of course is always one of the topics for these town hall meetings, as well as transplantation. And um, uh, she has really been focusing her career a lot on new agents and new strategies for treatment of patients with relapsed refractory Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And finally, Eitan Stein, um, who uh, I don't know if you're from Chicago, but you did a lot of your training in Chicago. Uh, he's currently at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, he is an expert in the treatment of acute and chronic leukemias and mild dysplastic syndromes, as well as proliferative disorders such as myelofibrosis and polycythemia vera. And his uh, research focus really is in new and innovative approaches to treating acute myeloid leukemia. Again, one of the hot topics that we're gonna be covering today. So uh, again, uh, to my colleagues, thank you for uh, participating in this town hall meeting. And uh, you know, uh, this is another one of these darn Zoom meetings um, that we all have to suffer through over the last couple of years. And uh, I always try to look for a little glimmer of hope. And if you're from Chicago, you'll know what I mean by uh, the comment when I say, at least you don't have to show your vaccination card to enter. <laughs> For those not from Chicago, you have to show your vaccination card to go pretty much anywhere uh, lately. And it's, we don't have trucks here yet, uh, like in, in Canada, but uh, it's caused a lot of problems recently. So I'm gonna take the prerogative of asking the first question, because this is something that always comes up uh, and for each of you, you're going to have an opportunity to answer, um, and we'll just go in order. Um, a lot of times, patients end up with cancers, and they don't know where in the heck they got it from, and this is true for blood cancers as well. So I'd like each of you to focus on your areas of ex expertise. For, for uh, So uh, Dr. Meta myeloma, Dr. Uh, Smith, uh, perhaps not Hodgkin's lymphoma, and, and Dr. Stein, um, uh, acute leukemia. Um, what are the risk factors for getting these diseases? Is there anything patients can do to prevent the risk factors? And what are the familial uh, uh, nuances uh, that people should be thinking about or looking, uh, looking for? Um, some of these things are relatively new in the last couple of years. And um, so uh, let's start with uh, Jayesh. So for myeloma and plasma cell disorders, it's known that uh, exposure to large amounts of radiation and possibly to certain chemicals, uh, which are really not in widespread use anymore and fertilizers and pesticides may contribute to development of myeloma. But it's fair to say that for the overwhelming majority of patients, there is no cause that can be found. So for patients who are worried that uh, it was something they did or they did not do, the answer is, it's like a lightning strike. There was nothing you did. 
that uh, caused it and nothing that could have that you could have done to prevent it as far as fa family uh, involvement is concerned there is certainly a slightly higher risk than average of a patient with a, a myeloma or a plasma cell disorder developing a plasma cell disorder but it is nowhere near a level that is uh, concerning enough to do any additional screening uh, or anything like that uh, uh, so um, uh, it's, it's really all for all practical purposes a random disease that others in the family do not need to be concerned about. Okay, Dr. Smith. Uh, so for non-Hodgkin lymphomas, you know, this is a very large family of cancers. And, uh, you know, for any one person in the vast majority of cases, we don't know what caused it, but we do know some risk factors include, um, you know, immune suppression. So people who either have uh, autoimmune disease or are being treated with immunosuppressants or have viruses that can knock down the immune system like HIV, there's a higher risk of lymphoma. Um, that can happen for some people. For others, there is an increasing observation that there is a family history where blood cancers may occur within one family. And you know, to Dr. Mehta's point, we don't always know what those risk factors are for families. Um, we do have a lot of uh, cancer risk investigation. So we have people who are trying to understand where there could be a genetic link, but it's really not that well established. And then similar to myeloma, there may be an environmental component where we know that some lymphomas are increased in the farm belt, for example. So there's a thought that certain pesticides or other chemicals may contribute. Um, but, you know, I will say that for the most, for the vast majority of patients, we don't always know what caused their specific lymphoma. And Dr. Stein. Yeah, so similar to what my colleague said, um, in most cases of acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndromes, the, the cause of the disease is really unknown, and there's nothing you can or cannot do or did that, that caused the disease. Um, people who have been in sort of nuclear accidents can sometimes, uh, you know, around Chernobyl or if they were in Hiroshima, there's a slight, there's an increased risk of getting um, acute myeloid leukemia, but but you know, obviously most of us are not exposed to that. Um, when it comes to familial causes of acute leukemias or acute myeloid leukemia, you know, again, it's a very, very rare event, but there have been described, and a lot of this work has been done um, by uh, Lucy Godley at the University of Chicago, Dr. Smith's uh, colleague, who, um, who has shown that there are a number of genetic mutations that occasionally can run in families and lead to an increased rate of the development of acute myeloid leukemia. Um, we tell people that if they've got, you know, a father or a brother or a sister or grandparents where everyone in the family has acute leukemia, that's someone who should be evaluated. But otherwise, again, for the vast majority of people, that's not going to be the case. Okay. Um, let's uh, then uh, delve into uh... The, the, the questions. And one of the first questions that I'm going to ask uh, each of you again is what is the best way to find doctors and clinics with interest and expertise in your particular cancer diagnosis? J.S., you go first again. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there are a number of uh, patient uh, advocacy uh, groups uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the LRF is one of them. They are good sources of information, uh, uh, American Cancer Society and so on. Uh, there are um, some other disease-specific uh, uh, advocacy groups that can also provide information, but I think that one has to look at, uh, one has to look at convenience, try and get uh, references uh, from people you know uh, some uh, online for our Facebook groups and so on. Uh, there are people who are active who will give you some guidance uh, in terms of uh, what to do. Do a little research, do a little reading of your own. The key is uh, to be comfortable with whoever it is that you uh, uh, choose. Uh, but with complex diseases uh, like the three hematologic malignancies, the broad groups that we are talking about, uh, it's never a bad idea to have uh, someone from a large uh, academic institution uh, like, like uh, the ones that the four of us represent uh, is always worthwhile, despite the inconvenience. And I, I would just add, you know, 
Um, I, I completely agree. You know, Lymphoma Research Foundation, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, you know, will have some people. The other uh, way to try to figure it out would be to, you know, where are the largest or the most comprehensive cancer centers? And, you know, a cancer center is essentially a group of people, you know, who usually at an academic center um, are dedicated to, to studying a specific cancer and then trying to improve upon it. And so in general, a lot of experts will go there. And all of our institutions have cancer centers. Um, some are comprehensive uh, cancer centers, which may have a little bit more of the science there uh, for some of the research. But in terms of, you know, great doctors, you know, these larger centers are, are really helpful. And the only, yeah, so the only thing I would add to what, to what the others have said is that, um, you know, everything about COVID is bad, except for, for maybe one thing, which is that um, it has increased our use of telemedicine and it has allowed patients really in far-flung corners of the country to have access to experts in other corners of the country where they may not have had that access before. So for example, um, where I am in New York City, our institution, because we have so many patients that travel back and forth between New York and Florida, I have actually been required to get a Florida telemedicine license. And now um, I can see patients uh, in Florida for, for second opinions um, through a video chat. So um, that may exist at other institutions. And I think it broadens the reach of where one is able to um, get a second opinion or, or even a third opinion sometimes. Well, I, I guess I agree with everything that's been said. I think uh, to uh, echo what Jash was saying, uh, it never hurts to get a second opinion. I find a lot of times patients who come to academic centers to get a second opinion actually leave with pretty much the same recommendation that, that the treatment that they're getting uh, is uh, the, the right way to go. And the benefits to the patients and the families are enormous there from the psychological standpoint. So. Uh, you you establish a relationship if the if the cancer were to come back with uh, with an expert at an academic center who may be more in tune with treating more advanced disease or disease that's relapsed. But at the same time, you 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 also get that knowledge that hey, my local doctor and and all oncologists trained at these academic centers. Uh, my my local doctor really does know what he's doing, and um, I'm I I don't have to drive. From Florida, from Florida to New York to, to get care. So I, I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with getting a second opinion. And if your doctor is upset about you getting a second opinion, I always tell patients, then maybe it's time to get another doctor because uh, <laughs> you know uh, we're all happy. We share patients uh, in Chicago all the time. And if somebody wants another opinion. Uh, uh, there, there's sometimes nuances that uh, somebody might know a little bit more about and it, it helps patient care and it helps us as well. All right, so let's get into uh, some of the research and new emergency treatment questions. And there's a, a group of questions uh, that uh, relate to multiple myeloma, um, including what are the groundbreaking treatments? Um, is there anything that's currently uh, looking hot, if you will, that's gonna be available uh, by FDA approval um, um, shortly? And um, uh, what about uh, uh, CAR T cells for multiple myeloma and some of these newer therapies called bites? So Jayesh, you're up again. Um, I, I think the field of myeloma uh, therapy has moved swiftly and continues to move. Uh, as uh, you point out, uh, TAR T cells and the uh, bispecific T cell engagers, the bite therapy, uh, probably represent two of the most exciting advances at the moment. Uh, uh, one CAR T product, uh, BECMA, has been approved. Uh, unfortunately, availability is a major issue at the moment. Uh, the retroviral ve vector that is required to prepare the CAR T cells is in short supply. And uh, there are only uh, 100... Uh, uh, products that are being processed per month in the entire country. And we typically get uh, two to three of those uh, each month. Uh, by a second product is likely to be licensed in the next couple of months. And uh, the bite, uh, the antibody therapy, tries to do a CAR-T-like uh, um, work by uh, uh, activating T cells uh, inside the body to uh, attack the myeloma. 
uh, unlike CAR T cells where you were to take the T cells out, modify them and then uh, inject them back. So I think uh, uh, things, are, things are definitely improving. One is learning to harvest the immune system well. The early results for all of these are very, very exciting. Uh, patients with res resistant disease also respond. The problem is that so far we've been using them in people with such advanced and refractory disease. Disease is that uh, uh, the responses, at least in myeloma, tend to be relatively short lasting. And I think as uh, time goes by, we may have to start considering the use of these agents earlier in the course of the disease to try and get the best bang for the buck. These are very expensive. Uh, or to the tune of uh, several hundred thousand dollars. And uh, it would be nice to utilize them at a time when the patient is in a good shape and the disease is in such a condition that one can maximize the benefit. Okay, next um, question. Um, how, how does iron metabolism factor into follicular lymphoma? Uh, Dr. Smith, what are the types of therapies for follicular lymphoma showing promise? or cure, that's not a word that we usually use with follicular lymphoma, and what are the potential timeframes for these becoming available? So in other words, can you give a brief update of follicular lymphoma and, uh, and then, uh, sorry, iron metabolism? Yeah, maybe I'll answer the iron metabolism one first because it's a little shorter. And you know, the bottom line is that there is no great connection between iron metabolism and follicular lymphoma. Um, you know, and it kind of leads into you know, once somebody has follicular lymphoma, you know, what are any of the diet or environmental factors that might influence uh, follicular lymphoma, you know, like what its path might be. And the only thing that's really come up is that uh, there's suggestions that vitamin D deficiency, you know, is associated with, um, you know, follicular lymphoma, maybe having a little bit more of, a, of, a, of an aggressive behavior. And that's being tested right now in a, in a clinical trial to see if vitamin D replacement can help. But other than that, there's really no uh, strong data about diet and uh, other sort of vitamins or supplements that influence follicular lymphoma behavior. Uh, when it comes to follicular lymphoma, this is the second most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma we see. It is something that is generally slow growing in the vast majority of people. It will you know, wax and wane over a person's lifetime. And at some point they will need treatment to beat it down. And in most people, it can be sort of a chronic disease. Uh, in a small percent of patients, this can uh, have a more angry course and often need you know, more aggressive chemotherapy or transplant or even CAR T cell therapy. And unfortunately, we don't have those kinds of tools where when we first meet somebody, we know which one of those two paths they might go down. Um, I do hesitate to use the word cure uh, with follicular lymphoma. This is something we can treat, but it is very difficult to uh, completely eliminate. That being said, um, I think as some new tools come along, I don't want to take cure as the goal off the table, but I don't think we're there right now. And what about new, what, what are the newest therapies for follicular lymphoma in your opinion? Yeah, well, I think for follicular lymphoma, it's been a very busy several years. And I would put the drugs or the, the treatment approaches into three categories that are new. Um, one is CAR T cell therapy. So we already heard about this from Dr. Mehta, but um, CAR T cell therapy takes a person's own T cells and engineers them to identify and find the lymphoma cells, or at least a protein on the lymphoma cells called CD19. And then those T cells grow and attack and, and kill the lymphoma. And this uh, was approved for use in people with follicular lymphoma recently. And uh, although we're still trying to figure out exactly who is the best person to benefit from this, it's very clear that some patients who get CAR T cell therapy can have their disease go into remission and be controlled for a very long period of time, even when other approaches have not worked. So that's one new therapy. Another new therapy um, is that there are some what we call targeted agents out there. So these are generally pills that are uh, geared towards either mutations that are in the follicular lymphoma. So tazemetostat was approved for use in follicular lymphoma um, and, is a, and will attack a specific pathway. And then there are other drugs such as lenalidomide, uh, also called Revlimid, which uh, is very active in follicular lymphoma and PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, which block another pathway uh, and one example there would be uh, umbralisib. So these are all targeted agents that I think are exciting. What's not yet approved, but I think is gonna happen sometime soon 
is going to be the bispecific antibody. So as Dr. Mehta already explained, this is an antibody similar to rituximab in that it you know, binds to a protein on the lymphoma cells, but in this case bind, brings in T cells. So it binds to two different proteins on two different cells. And the goal is to activate the T cells to attack the lymphoma. So not yet approved, but there's a couple of uh, bispecific antibodies that I think are, are gonna be available very soon, or at least I hope. Okay, uh, not to leave you by the side, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Stein, there was a couple questions on CMML or chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. Uh, the question, I understand CMML normally progresses to AML. Is this correct? And what other conditions might CMML lead to? What are the prognostic scoring tools that are used uh, to determine prognosis in this disease? Um, and uh, are there any new targeted therapies in the pipeline for this disease? I guess maybe how would you treat it? And then uh, how would you uh, treat it if it comes back? Sure. So, so CMML, for those of you who don't know, is a disease called chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. Um, sometimes people, even insurance companies, uh, confuse it with CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a completely different disease. So here we're talking about CMML. And CMML is an interesting disease because it has features of a myelodysplastic syndrome where the, the cells in the bone marrow, the baby blood cells in the bone marrow, are abnormally created and, and um, what are called dysplastic, meaning they don't look normal and they can't produce normal blood cells for um, a patient's body. But it also has features of a myeloproliferative neoplasm, meaning that you get too many of a kind of white blood cell called a monocyte. And like all of these diseases, there are sort of different levels of CMML. We, we grade it from CMML zero, which is sort of the earliest form of the disease, to CMML2, which is a more advanced form of the disease. And as you go from CMML0 to CMML2, you have um, an increased risk of the disease turning into um, acute myeloid leukemia. Pretty much that's the only disease um, or that the, the, the end pathway for this disease is that over enough time, and if you're at high enough risk, the, the disease can develop into acute myeloid leukemia. Um, so the question about the risk factors and the scoring systems, you, you know, they're, they're, you, they're sort of complicated, but they basically fall into, into three different categories. They look at the number of what are called blasts in the bone marrow. So those are the immature blood cells. If a patient has um, an increased number of immature blasts in the bone marrow, that is a negative prognostic sign. If patients have certain chromosome rearrangements or genetic mutations, that are adverse risk, that's another negative prognostic sign. And the third negative prognostic sign is how cytopenic a patient is, meaning how low are your blood counts. So if your blood counts are normal and you have CMML, that's good. If your blood counts are, are very, very low and you're requiring transfusions, that's, um, that's not great. The treatments for CMML really overlap with the treatments that we give for acute myeloid leukemia and the treatments that we give for myelodysplastic syndrome. The most common treatment is a class of drugs called hypomethylating agents. But I think a lot of the research that's being done now is trying to add on targeted therapies to the hypomethylating agents to um, improve the outcome. So patients with CMML will have a variety of different mutations and, and we have a number of treatments that are in development or some even approved that can be used to target those genetic mutations. And the thought is that if you combine the targeted therapies with the already approved hypomethylating agents, you can get um, better outcomes and, and disease control. But finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about um, transplants. So at, at the end of the day, probably the only way to permanently cure CMML is with what's called an allogeneic stem cell transplant. An allogeneic stem cell transplant um, when it works, fundamentally gets rid of the diseased bone marrow cells that are causing the CMML. And, and that is, is probably what a patient will need ultimately to permanently be rid of their disease. Certainly there are patients who may do well for many, many years with CMML uh, who don't have the prognostic factors that you talked about. Um, and so uh, uh, it, it's, it's not inevitable that patients are going to transform to acute leukemia, right? And, uh, Correct. Um, and Correct. Um, um, uh, need uh, something like a transplant. There are some new agents. Uh, one of them that's going to be done in the cooperative group uh, 
And the National Cooperative Group, the NCI sponsored cooperative groups is a drug called TIM3, which is a, a new um, um, an immune stimulant um, that may have specific activity in CMML in a very preliminary study. So uh, for those with this disease, keep your eye on the ball. And uh, again, uh, uh, our strategy is if you have to get a hypomethylating agent because of bad prognosis, then you probably need a transplant in short order. Um, so Jayesh, um, I'm gonna ask you next uh, about Revlimid. Uh, one question came through, what percentage of patients receiving Revlimid develop other cancers? In other words, is this a risk factor for, for getting a second cancer or um, uh, it, was, was that overblown? Because I know early data suggested that some patients were getting acute leukemia. Uh, I think uh, Revlimid, uh, that entire class of drugs, Revlimid, pomalidomide, and thalidomide, uh, they do increase the risk of uh, second malignancies. Uh, most of them tend to be hematologic malignancies, myelodysplastic dysplastic syndrome and leukemia but some uh, other cancers as well. I would say that uh, uh, it probably doubles the risk uh, compared to the baseline risk uh, that patients with myeloma have. So if you assume that the baseline risk is uh, over a period of uh, 10 years is somewhere in the 5% uh, range, this is closer to 10%. Uh, if you consider 4%, then it's closer to eight or 9%. Uh, but the key is, uh, uh, the drug does make a profound uh, impact on response and survival. So despite the slightly higher absolute risk of developing a malignancy, which is going to be 5%, 5% baseline, 5% more, the, it's not a good enough reason to curtail or uh, not use the drug because it improves survival. I think the key is to uh, watch patients who are receiving uh, these class of drugs very closely for development of another malignancy. What would you be looking for in such a patient? Uh, I think one would uh, make sure that they have uh, 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 proper health screens uh, uh, for second malignancies, uh, you know, skin checks. Uh, and of course, one keeps a close watch on uh, uh, blood counts. Uh, one of the uh, problems with Revlimid is that uh, it can lower the blood counts. And one of the manifestations of myelodysplastic syndrome is uh, low blood counts. So if one sees uh, low blood counts in a patient with Revlimid that do not uh, correct easily after uh, adjusting the dose or holding the drug for a period of time, then it would be worthwhile looking for, uh, for MDS. So we, we see a number of patients where the uh, attribution of the low counts is to Revlimid. Revlimid also causes the red cells to become larger. That's a condition called macrocytosis, which can also be seen in, uh, in uh, MDS. So then it's important to keep a watch for that and do a bone marrow if needed. Perhaps even a, a more difficult question to answer is how long should somebody receive Revlimid as maintenance therapy after an auto transplant for multiple myeloma? I think this is a great question. And uh, the data that we have at the moment suggests that the drug should be continued indefinitely. And I, I remember seeing the list of questions and a lot of questions are to do with the length of maintenance therapy in myeloma. Because myeloma is not a curable disease, but it can be kept controlled. One can keep the genie in the bottle, if you will. It is important to continue maintenance therapy. And uh, what we tend to do is do maintenance therapy in a manner that allows the patient to lead their life normally. If there are significant side effects, uh, then we make adjustments. And uh, if those adjustments don't work, eventually we end up uh, potentially stopping the maintenance therapy. Uh, uh, it's not that giving maintenance therapy guarantees lack of relapse, it is going to relapse. And not giving maintenance therapy does not guarantee that it's going to come back very fast, but it does help. And uh, it's worth doing as long as it is possible to do it uh, uh, with acceptable quality of life. I have patients who have been on Revlimid for 12 and 13 years, and I have uh, patients on uh, Bortezomib or Wellcare who have been on maintenance therapy with the drug since uh, I think about 2005 continuously. So as long as you keep your watch out for side effects and quality of life, it's not a problem. Can I ask a question? What about um, the concept of minimal residual disease on maintenance? You know, this is, uh, there may be a question there, uh, Pat, on this as well, but I'll ask Jayesh, you know, in myeloma, 
you know, what, are there studies that can help guide when treatment should be stopped? That's a fabulous question and it is not there in the list. So I'm glad you asked. So minimal residual disease in myeloma has been shown to influence prognosis mm -hmm. uh, in a manner that is completely logical. For any of the diseases we treat, a patient who has disease is always going to do worse than a patient who does not have the disease, all else being equal. And if you go down to what is called a complete remission, a, an MRD positive complete remission where there's a little bit of minimal residual disease, it's always going to fare slightly worse off than somebody who is MRD negative and is in complete remission. But does that mean that you can stop maintenance therapy? Those data do not exist. Mm -hmm. And such studies have not been done yet. And that really is the key to minimal residual disease uh, investigation, certainly in solid tumors, where MRD negativity is in some disease is very strongly uh, correlated with the disease not coming back at all. We don't have those data in myeloma. We certainly do not stop maintenance therapy uh, if the MRD becomes uh, negative. Well, there's a national study ongoing, uh, SWAG 1803, that uh, some of you may be familiar with, and this is a randomized maintenance trial of Revlimid versus Revlimid and a second drug called Daratubumab, which is an antibody against uh, one of the components on the myeloma cells, uh, CD38. And this is a randomized trial where half the patients get Revlimid, half the patients get um, the combination. And at two years, patients undergo a bone marrow. And if they are MRD negative, they will be randomized between stopping the therapy and continuing the therapy. So as JS mentioned, we don't have the answers, but uh, we hope to get the answers. And this is a trial that uh, took many years to get going. And uh, I think uh, many of us felt like JS does that we should continue it indefinitely, but the National Cancer Institute said, hey, wait a second, uh, you know, these drugs are extremely expensive as some of the uh, questions uh, allude to, and we'll get to those. But um, so, why, why would we not have a trial where we considered stopping this at least uh, um, uh, to test whether or not there's gonna be a, an advantage just for economic reasons alone. So that, that is ongoing and, and anybody who's completed an auto transplant is eligible for this study, study and it's open at many, many of our centers. And it's a terrific so, so next, let's go back to uh, lymphoma. Uh, 40 years ago, I studied chemo drugs in CHOP uh, I think that's how long we've all been studying it, or some of us. What new drugs have been developed for diffuse large B cell lymphomas, um, Sony? And uh, how would you uh, go about treating a newly diagnosed patient today, still with CHOP? Yeah, so really, really great question. I would say that at least in the last, you know, CHOP was the standard of care since 1976. That was when it was first published, and it didn't really. Uh, get beat until 2002 when rituximab first came around. So we then went through a lull where, you know, we just didn't have a whole lot of drugs that made a big impact. And now all of a sudden in the last five years or so, we have a tremendous number of new FDA approved options. And, you know, I would just say kind of working backwards um, for people who have had diffuse large B cell lymphoma come back a number of times, we have CAR T cell therapy and for people who are not able to go through CAR T cell therapy, we have other uh, agents and regimens that are approved, such as tafacinumab, lenalidomide, lancastuximab, uh, tesserine, selenexor, and polituzumab plus VR. So these are all targeted agents in one way or another, uh, you know, often without chemotherapy. And uh, you know, these are really making a difference in terms of options for people when the disease has come back a number of times. What's kind of new at ASH this year, so ASH is our national meeting for blood cancers and blood disorders that was in December. We heard data about a new antibody called polituzumab. So this is an antibody drug conjugate. So it's like a Trojan horse. It goes in, it finds its target, and then it releases a little bit of chemotherapy directly in the area where the tumor is, uh, where the lymphoma cells are. So we saw that polituzumab with our CHOP uh, improves something called progression-free survival for people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma by about uh, five to 6%. So um, if you ask what's new in the, in the relapse setting, we have a ton of options. Uh, 
in the frontline setting, I think it's still our chop until we see whether or not polituzumab gets FDA approved. And then if and when it does, um, that may become a new standard of care. Okay, so we'll maybe get back to some of the newer drugs for, for relapse later. Uh, next, uh, um, just I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Uh, there's a question about uh, menin inhibitors uh, for MLL associated uh, acute, uh, acute uh, lymphoid leukemia or mixed lineage leukemia with a KMT2A uh, mutation. Uh, the question is, uh, there's, there's one compound being tested currently, the Syndex molecule. Actually, there's a second one. How soon could this be FDA approved? Um, I'm, I'm hope you have your crystal ball. Um, uh, and what uh, therapy should be given before, with, or after CAR T therapy for ALL, including men inhibitors? Or how would you see this ultimately being used in patients with mixed lineage leukemia? Sure. So, so just to back up for a second, for those who don't know, th there's a subset of patients with acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoblastic leukemia who have chromosomal rearrangements involving um, chromosome 11. And those are called MLL rearrangements, or the other name is KMT2A rearrangements. Um, there is a protein called menin that is thought to be intricately involved in the development of these kinds of leukemias with, these, with this particular chromosome rearrangement. And um, there's data that actually we presented at ASH, the meeting that, that Dr. Smith was just mentioning, showing that in patients with relapsed and refractory, acute lymphoblastic and acute myeloid leukemia with these MLL rearrangements, the response rate is about 55%. What's really exciting, maybe more than the response, I mean, that's really exciting, but what's really, really exciting is that of those responses, 92% of them were MRD negative, so had no uh, minimal residual disease. So there are a lot of drug companies that are, that are trying to um, get menin inhibitors uh, approved. I'm aware of four other menin inhibitors in clinical trials for patients with AML and ALL. The Syndax drug is the one that's farthest along. I really think that these drugs are gonna get approved within the next couple of years. Uh, I don't know if it'll be a full approval, it will likely be an accelerated approval first, but these drugs are very, very effective. Um, and I think they're gonna really um, have a place in our arsenal of treatments for patients with at least this subtype of, of acute leukemia. So then the question is, well, well, then what do you do after it gets approved for relapsed and refractory disease? And what we then wanna do is take these drugs and we wanna move them up into earlier lines of therapy because you want to give your best treatments at the very beginning, or that's what I think you need to do. And likely we'll be giving these drugs in combination with our standard of care um, induction chemotherapies or other, or other therapies. Um, now, when it comes to CAR T cells, you know, there's, a, there's a split between what we have for acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. So in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, CAR T cells are, are approved. Um, and in a patient with um, an MLL rearrangement, you can imagine that a patient might get CAR T cells um, as a therapy to put their disease into remission and then maybe get a menin inhibitor as maintenance therapy afterwards, or maybe you can uh, do things in, in the opposite direction also. For acute myeloid leukemia, we don't really have CAR T cells that are, are effective yet, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, so the use of menin inhibitors, I think, will happen in AML, but, but whether CAR T cells happen in AML is a much uh, more, um, it's a little bit more unclear at this point. Okay. Um, next, some questions about uh, chronic lymphoid leukemia. Um, first of all, um, I am at stage zero and while I like to know what CLL is doing to my body, are there any long-term uh, consequences to this? Um, I have terrible leg pains and no doctor knows what it's coming from. Can I just watch and wait for years uh, with CLL? Mm -hmm. I'll throw that open to whoever wants to, uh, to give a shout out. Sure, I can start. I mean, for CLL, um, you know, this, this is actually a blood cancer that has two names, chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. If it's mostly in the blood, we call it leukemia. If it's mostly in the lymph nodes, we call it lymphoma, but they are the same exact disease. Um, this is a, a, a very slow growing 
uh, leukemia that you know can often take years before it actually needs treatment. And you know, similar to other slow-growing lymphomas, we know that treating somebody before they need treatment does not help them live longer or live better. And so it's really in the person's best interest to try to watch it for as long as, as we can. Um, there are maybe some high risk subsets. So in other words, when we have somebody with CLL, sometimes we will do chromosome analysis, something called FISH um, or other mutation studies. And there is a clinical trial that was done uh, through the cooperative group to see if treating some people with high risk earlier actually makes a difference. But overall, um, the, you know, there's really no advantage to treating somebody before they need treatment. In terms of what it's doing to a person's body at a, at a rise stage zero is probably very little. Um, it's, you know, this essentially means that they see some cells in the blood, but it hasn't filled up any of the lymph nodes yet and all of the other blood counts are still normal. Um, so it is unlikely uh, to be the cause of pain in the legs. Now, there are some people where CLL as a, as a B cell, it can make an antibody that is an autoantibody. So it can attack you know, some normal parts of the body, either red cells or platelets. Um, so sometimes you can have autoimmune diseases that go along with it. But I, I think in general, a rise stage zero is unlikely to be the cause of the symptoms. Just one last thing I'll say about CLL though, is that right now with the pandemic that's ongoing, there is data that people who have CLL, regardless of whether or not they're on treatment, may not have as good of a response to some of the vaccines. And so this is something to talk about with your, with your doctor. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Mehta, uh, what are uh, the prognostic factors that you use in determining therapy, initial therapy for a patient with multiple myeloma? So the differences uh, in prognostic factors make limited difference in choice of initial therapy. I think they affect prognosis uh, much more and subsequent steps of therapy, uh, including some really more intense treatments uh, more. But uh, to just talk about prognostic factors, I would say that uh, the most important prognostic factor is uh, the uh, genetic abnormalities within the malignant cells, within the myeloma cells themselves, what we call cytogenetics and FISH. Uh, a new uh, technique called next generation sequencing gives uh, sometimes more information. And then there are uh, other things like the platelet count and uh, uh, blood tests called LDH, uh, uh, beta 2 microglobulin, albumin, many, many conventional prognostic factors. But really it is the genetic and the molecular nature of the cells that is the overwhelmingly uh, important determinant of prognosis in myeloma. And what are the bad ones? Uh, so uh, deletion uh, or missing chromosome 17 in part or completely uh, is uh, perhaps the most important one. Uh, on that particular chromosome is located uh, uh, a uh, gene that uh, helps the body control uh, malignancies. And if that is lost, malignancies tend to misbehave. That's a prognostic factor that's common. That particular genetic abnormality is common to multiple cancers. Uh, and uh, then there is another one called uh, uh, plus one Q, where there is a part of uh, chromosome one that is extra, one P minus, where there is a part of chromosome one that can be missing. Then uh, uh, translocation or a mashup between uh, chromosomes four and 14, uh, 14 and 16, 14 and 20, 16 and 20. Uh, many more extra chromosomes, uh, missing chromosomes. These are, these are the important prognostic factors, adverse. And the question about life expectancy and AML, and I'll, I'll try to rephrase it a little bit. Dr. Stein, uh, you have a patient who's gotten chemotherapy and uh, is doing well, is in remission. What other chances are being cured if they're in remission six months, a year, two years, five years? Uh, give us kind of, kind of a, a, a gestalt uh, of that. And this could be potentially uh, two parts, one with transplant and one without transplant. Okay, so um, the general rule is that the longer you're in remission, the better it is, however you got there. So 
if you're in remission two years, it's better than being in it. it you're more likely to stay in remission than if you were in remission um, six months. So your chances of remaining in remission increase the longer you're in remission. However, you got to that remission, whether it was um, with a transplant or without a transplant. You know, we typically offer stem cell transplants for those patients who have a higher risk of relapse. So those patients with unfavorable and intermediate risk disease. Um, and in that setting, if you've had a transplant, your chances of relapse are likely going to be lower than if you did not have a transplant, but every person's individual situation is slightly different. So that is a very, very broad rule, but, but certainly cannot be applied to everybody. I'll just mention one uh, tri retrospective trial that was presented at the ASH meeting a number of years ago, showing that for patients who remained in remission for three or more years, their chances of relapse were very, very low. In fact, the chances of relapse after a year, after the third year of remission were about the same as the chances of relapse after the fifth year of remission. So if you get to three years without relapsing, your chances of relapse are very, very low. If you get to five years, they're extremely low. The number of patients who relapse after five years is, is um, um, you know, extraordinarily low. And, and I think most people are in the clear at that point. Great, that's a great answer, thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, uh, as uh, somebody who's uh, uh, seen and treated a lot of patients, we get a lot of questions always every year about the cost of drugs. So I'm going to address this one to you and then uh, see if anybody else wants to add anything. Why are blood cancer therapies so prohibitively expensive? Given expense, are fixed term therapies such as venetoclax or benetuzumab an effective long term choice for patients with CLL? that has not been previously treated? What are the symptoms and genetic characteristics that would cause you to recommend a different treatment um, uh, of, uh, rather than venetoclax and venetuzumab for um, CLL, newly diagnosed? So those are some really important questions. Um, you know, just speaking to drug costs in general, I don't think it's limited to blood cancer. Um, in fact, some of the immunotherapy drugs that are used for what we call solid cancers like lung cancer, melanoma, et cetera, you know, are, are billions of dollars in terms of cost and revenue for, you know, some of the companies that make them. So things are very expensive all around um, and not just limited to blood cancer. Um, and why it's that high, I think is a really good question. Um, there are many groups that are advocating to curb cancer drug costs. Um, there's also people who are investigating how to repurpose old drugs, if you will, you know, drugs that may be generic or, you know, fallen, uh, you know, weren't developed in quite the same way. And maybe there's an advantage there, both based on how effective they are, and maybe they will, they will be cheaper. So I think those are some important sort of themes in all of cancer. Uh, when it comes to CLL, you know, the person who's asking the question is correct. When somebody is first diagnosed, we have several options for how to treat them. Um, some options are what we call time limited, meaning that, you know, there's a fixed duration of time for treatment. So one of those is bendamustine and rituximab. Another is venetoclax and obinutuzumab. Um, and there's also some newer combinations that are being developed that are either 12 months or 18 months. In contrast, there's also some options where once people start that treatment, they stay on it until it stops working. So something like starting with a brutinib and taking that until it no longer works or a calibrutinib. So why would we pick you know, the, the more expensive, longer duration one over venetoclax or benetuzumab? You know, I, I think that's a really personal decision. There are times when people don't want the infusion. So benetuzumab is an IV medication that has uh, some you know, infusion reaction. So sometimes people don't want something IV. Um, the other uh, challenge is that sometimes with the obinutuzumab and venetoclax, you're more likely to get something called tumor lysis syndrome, which is where the cells die so quickly they can release things into the blood that can be hard on the kidneys. So, you know, these are all, the best part about this is that we have options and there are pros and cons to all of it. Um, so I, I think that's probably the way that I would just say is that talk to your doctor about what's best for you. Um, I do tend to go towards the limited duration uh, in general because I, I think being done and off of it uh, is, is great. 
but it's not for everybody. And uh, again, to my theme of clinical trials, there's uh, national trials that have just been completed uh, for uh, patients of all ages with CLL looking at some of these questions. Uh, unfortunately, um, and fortunately, uh, we won't have the answers for a few years, fortunately, because patients do very well and we're looking for survival, of course. And unfortunately, because we won't have the answers. So I agree, uh, talk to your docs. Uh, the imidacloxabinituzumab is relatively new and uh, we need a little bit more time to see what's happening with those patients beyond two and three years, but certainly uh, a therapy that uh, uh, may be of, of value. I guess I'm old enough to also uh, consider uh, fludarabine-based combinations, which were six months and then stop in certain patient groups, subgroups of patients with CLL have actually done well for 10 to 20 years with that six month uh, treatment. So, so let's, let's continue the theme a little bit about cost and says, why are patient savings programs for drugs like uh, abrutinib and uh, calibrutinib only available for people with commercial health insurance and not for Medicare patients? This is a question that we get all the time and I'll let anybody uh, grab that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, our government and its wisdom, uh, Medicare, uh, dictates that uh, the patient's portion of the payment and the government's portion of the payment has to be uh, treated the same way. So if a company is willing to provide assistance to the patient for uh, their share of the payment, they have to provide the same uh, assistance to the government as well. So if a company wants to write off uh, the copay for ibrutinib or Revlimid, they have to write off the entire cost for the government. I mean, you know, uh, that's that's the reality, the, the way they operate. Whereas with commercial insurance, uh, such a prohibition does not exist and therefore assistance can be provided. So the paradox here is that people who are in most need of assistance are senior citizens and people on Medicare do not get the assistance. And uh, those who perhaps could do with a limited assistance sometimes have a $0 copay. It's, it's a bizarre paradox, but uh, there we are. Well, what, what has also happened is that the, uh, there's a workaround now. And the, the workaround is that uh, the uh, patients with Medicare can get onto uh, uh, several of these foundation uh, and get grants uh, funded by the drug company. So a drug company that makes one of these expensive drugs sets up a foundation or gives money to a foundation, which then is able to give funds for co-pays and to help pay for the drugs for patients with uh, Medicare uh, um, and, and Medicaid. So uh, make sure that you explore all these options, go onto the websites of the drugs and uh, uh, talk to your pharmacist or your um, a center's pharmacy team, uh, uh, and they may be able to, to help you a bit. Next, let's go back a little bit to uh, CAR T's. And one of the questions is what about CAR T's for acute myeloid leukemia? Dr. Stein? Yeah, so, so the big issue with CAR T's for myeloid diseases is that the targets for the CAR T cells are not so great. So if you, if you look at a disease like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where the target um, for the CAR T's is CD19, what, what we've learned is that you can actually eradicate um, CD19 B cells in a patient without too much trouble to that patient down the road. The thing is that all of the targets that exist for AML exist on normal um, infection fighting cells as well and normal blood cells as well. And therefore, when you, when you give CAR T cells using those targets in AML, you kind of eradicate people's ability to produce any blood at all, any red blood cells, any platelets, any neutrophils. So most of the CAR T cell trials that um, have been used in AML and MDS for that matter, or high grade MDS, um, require you to have a stem cell transplant immediately after you get the CAR T cell therapy. There are some new um, strategies and some new CAR T cell products that are being worked on, but those are really in their infancy. And um, when patients say to me, you know, because CAR T cells are all over the news and all over, um, you know, everything, you know, because they're for myeloma and lymphoma. Um, so people hear about them, but when patients say to me, well, what about giving me CAR T cells for my AML? I say, unfortunately, it's just not 
not prime time yet for that. And, and we're, we're, we look at other therapies first. Well, let's, let's continue along this vein and, and finish. Uh, uh, there was a question about CAR T treatment for T cell ALL in children, probably adults as well. Um, both of us get the, the disease, T cell disease. Yeah, I guess I have to answer that one. So, yes. um, so I, there are efforts to create CAR T cells for T cell uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, again, that's an effort that's really in its infancy, but there are clinical trials I believe have just started looking at that. Um, it's interesting, you know, T cell um, leukemia is, um, or acute T cell leukemia is actually um, pretty uncommon. Um, and those patients actually do okay with, with our currently available therapies, not as well as we want them to do, but, but they do okay. So yes, there are efforts to, to use CAR T cells in T cell disease. Okay, so that's a question for each of you. Uh, there's a few questions on standard immunotherapy and let's, let's since we talked about CAR Ts, let's not get into that. But the, um, Dr. Smith mentioned drugs that are being used every day for lung cancer, uh, nivolumab, pembrolizumab. Um, why don't we hear a lot of these uh, uh, commercials, I guess, uh, for uh, pembro and multiple myeloma, nivolumab for uh, Hodgkin's disease? Uh, and there is some data, of course, with that. Can, you, can each of you then go over your diseases and, and talk about the standard immunotherapy with uh, PD-1 uh, blockers? Jayesh, yes, you want to start? So uh, the data uh, for PD-1 inhibitors, that particular specific type of immunotherapy simply do not exist in myeloma. Uh, clinical trials have been uh, done and uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, some of the trials have actually shown uh, adverse outcomes uh, because of increased toxicity. Uh, I have a feeling that those are things that can be taken care of with appropriate supportive therapy. But uh, we, because of that and because of lack of efficacy, we really do not use this class of drugs except in very limited circumstances. And those two situations are uh, patients who have had an allogenic stem cell transplant for myeloma and have relapsed where uh, it is felt that stimulating the immune system of the donor may help. And uh, in some cases of uh, myeloma patients who have uh, been treated with uh, CAR T cells off study uh, using a product called Abecma, we have tried to use uh, uh, this class of agents or a, a myeloma specific immunotherapy drug called elotuzumab uh, to try and stimulate the immune system to uh, harness the power of the T cells more. Yep. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ed. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, so for, you know, lymphomas and Hodgkin's, um, you know, the, we have to remember that these drugs, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, uh, ipilimumab, they all are targeted antibodies and they are against targets that are important in, and it differs depending on which cancer you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So out of the lymphomas and the Hodgkin and Hodgkin lymphomas, um, Hodgkin's is where we have the strongest evidence that PDL1 overexpression. So, in other words, that these cancer cells take advantage of this pathway to survive. And breaking that checkpoint, if you will, with pembrolizumab or nivolumab actually makes sense and, in fact, is incredibly active and is now being tested even in people who are newly diagnosed along with chemotherapy. Um, out of the non Hodgkin lymphomas, there's very few that actually have. Uh, you know, reliance on this, this pathway, this checkpoint um, with PDL1 or PD1. And uh, it's primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. And, you know, maybe there's a couple more, but not very many. So the, the studies have been done and these agents just don't work very well. So that's the lack of advertising. Uh, and then for myeloid diseases like MDS and, and AML, there have also been studies done. Um, with uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, which, which have been disappointing and, and haven't worked um, well at all. Th there is a checkpoint though, that's very interesting, which has gotten a lot of attention. And that is um, a macrophage activator by targeting CD47. So there's a drug called megrolimab, uh, 
that in myeloid diseases, when combined with um, azacitidine or dicytabine, actually primarily azacitidine in this case, seems to be um, very active and maybe particularly in a, in a specific subtype of AML and MDS that has a mutation in a gene called P53. So I, I, we haven't completely given up on, on some sort of immunotherapy for or checkpoint inhibitors, but, but the checkpoints that are targeted by Pembro and Nevo are probably not the right ones in, in myeloid malignancies. I muted myself for a second. Uh, yes, there's a, a coming up some national trials on megolovab in, in patients with elderly AML that uh, patients might be interested in uh, uh, finding out about those are going to be opening uh, relatively soon. It's a very exciting time for, uh, for uh, patients with um, uh, diseases eligible to be treated for this drug. And there are multiple companies working on this um, this, this antibody as well. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Smith, uh, what are the latest treatments for mantle cell lymphoma? And uh, what are the prognostic factors uh, that you use to uh, consider in treating a patient for this disease? Yeah, so mantle cell lymphoma is not a very common type of lymphoma, only, you know, maybe three to 4,000 new cases per year. Um, and the historical approach there has been to give intensive chemotherapy, get people into remission, and then do an auto transplant. And I would say there's maybe a couple of themes of new treatments for mantle cell lymphoma. The first is, what is the best way to get people into remission up front? And can we use some of the targeted agents like BTK inhibitors to get people into remission. And so there's a number of trials that are looking at combinations of either chemotherapy with or without BTK inhibitors, uh, including an intergroup study that is ongoing that uh, Dr. Stiff is a part of as well. The, the second question is, does everybody really need a transplant You know, if they go into remission? So here's where we're using that minimal residual disease um, study to you know, have a computer sort of uh, decide whether or not somebody gets a transplant. Because I, I do think it's important that not everybody needs or will benefit from it. And so that's what that trial is trying to do. Um, once the lymphomas come back multiple times, the probably the two approaches that have uh, had the most success uh, in the last several years, one is the availability of not just BTK inhibitors like abrutinib and calabrutinib and xanabrutinib, but also venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor. So there are some studies that when mantle cell lymphoma comes back, this can be a very uh, helpful drug. But the piece that I think is going to maybe be of the most interest is gonna be CAR T cell therapy, which is now FDA approved for mantle cell lymphoma when it comes back. So lots of new treatments that are out there and by specific antibodies are also being tested. When it comes to prognostic factors, uh, probably the two most important prognostic factors. One is whether or not there's a mutation of P53. So that's you know the same thing that Dr. Stein was alluding to. When P53 is mutated um, or deleted, uh, sometimes these lymphomas can be very, very aggressive and not respond to chemotherapy. So that's one prognostic factor. The second is how fast the lymphoma is growing. So something called proliferation. And there's different ways to measure this, but I would say that those are the two risk factors that I look at, look at. And then finally, just, it really depends on the person. Mantle cell lymphoma, the average age is 70. Um, so not everybody's gonna be a candidate for aggressive treatment, especially if they're you know, having lots of other medical conditions. So again, something that has to be personalized, but many new treatments along the way. Hey. Um... Some uh, relatively specific questions. I have essential thrombocythemia. I did not tolerate hydroxyurea. I'm on Jacopy now and have severe anemia five years later. I'm getting blood transfusions and iron and Procrit therapy. Please help. Okay, a plea for help, which is not, which is always, um, you know, hard to hear. I, you know, I, I again, without knowing the very the specifics of of this particular case, I'll just make some general comments. So when someone is becoming particularly cytopenic after or having low blood counts after a diagnosis of essential thrombocytosis, uh, 
if it hasn't been done, it is important to repeat a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy because in, in certain cases, that essential thrombocytosis can change into a disease where the bone marrow gets scarred over called myelofibrosis and the, and the blood counts can drop. So really the first thing to do is to really be sure that that isn't happening because the, the treatment for that and how we think about that um, changes things. If it's really still a central thrombocytosis, there are a variety of other treatments that could be considered. Um, people um, across the street from me at Cornell use a lot of uh, interferon treatment, which actually works pretty well if you can tolerate it. Um, so um, those would be options, but I would, I would recommend you know, talking to your doctor about it. And if you, you don't like what your doctor is saying, maybe get a second opinion with someone else. Okay, um, in the same uh, vein, um, in a myeloproliferative uh, patient, I was on by days after diagnosis and achieved remission. New doctor suggested a break from treatment after 26 cycles of IDASA after four months. He suggested Jacafee 20 milligrams twice a day. I am JAK2 positive and IDH1 positive. I'm worried that my MDS might come back just on Jacafee. How would you approach a patient like this? Obviously, this is a very, very specific, and uh, you really can't give us uh, a 100% effective answer. So how would you approach such a patient? Yeah, so, so it gets to the point of that when someone is having such a good response to a hypomethylating agent like Videza and has been on it for, it sounds like, over two years, um, is there a time that you can stop? And, and the unfortunate answer is we just don't know. Uh, the standard of care is just to continue with the Videza treatment indefinitely if a patient is, is tolerating it. Um, there are certain specific situations where a doctor might wanna stop and give a patient a break and then think about restarting if the disease gets worse again. I think the, the, the questioner raises the, the, the more broad question of what is the role of targeted therapy in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms or myelodysplastic syndrome or overlap syndromes. Um, there are clinical trials, I'll just say there are clinical trials that are investigating the use of the combination of JAK2 inhibitors like ruxolitinib with IDH inhibitors. There's an IDH1 inhibitor that's commercially available because what we've noticed is that if you use only one of the drugs, um, you don't get you don't get as much success as you might think you would, and that the thought is that you might need to use both drugs together. So I would encourage the questioner, number one, to talk to their doctor about it, but number two, to ask their doctor about clinical trials that might combine a JAK inhibitor with an IDH inhibitor. Okay. Hey. Uh, next, let's turn to CML, a disease we really haven't talked about just yet. I'm on spry cell for CML. I was able to get in a major molecular remission uh, within six months, uh, undetectable, uh, and maybe a candidate to go off spry cell after two years. What are the considerations in evaluating whether to continue spry cell for life or go off, go off after two years in remission and treatment? Um, what is the prognosis of CML uh, in remission and what is on the horizon for CML patients? And then um, I'm mostly a vegetarian healthy eater. Is there any particular diet to follow? Okay, I'll, I'll start at the end and go to the beginning. So there is no particular diet that one needs to follow um, that will affect um, CML. There may be other reasons to be a vegetarian or not be a vegetarian, but, but no, um, I'm not aware of data that shows that any particular diet is really gonna, gonna help or hurt. Um, so in terms of, of the, the spry cell and whether one can go off it, you know, there's now very, very good data that if someone is in a complete molecular remission, so not a major molecular remission, but a complete molecular remission, meaning that there is no evidence of the uh, BCR able transcript, there's no evidence of CML in the patient's blood. And if patients remain in a complete molecular remission for two years, and then you stop the spry cell, that about 50% of those patients will never need spry cell again. So they are functionally cured. Now, 50% of those patients will relapse. But the good news is that of the patients who relapse, nearly universally, if you restart the tyrosine kinase inhibitor like spry cell, those patients will get back into a very, very deep remission. So it, it really comes down to a question of, um, 
how anxious you are about stopping. Some patients uh, say, "There's, I don't even want to risk it. You know, I'm doing well on my spry cell. Why should I risk it? I'll be, I feel fine." And then I say, "Okay, continue the spry cell." And some patients, especially younger patients, say, "I don't want to be on this. It's, it's treatment for cancer. I don't want to be on treatment for cancer for the rest of my life." And in those patients, if they've meet, met the criteria of a complete molecular remission for two years, then I do offer them the chance of treatment discontinuation. Well, the last comment I'll make is that you know, these drugs are extraordinarily effective. They have now been given for many, many, many years and are very, very safe. And the life expectancy on these drugs is similar to the life expectancy of someone in the general population without CML. So either way you go, um, you're gonna make an okay decision. And I would, um, um, you know, just chat about it with your doctor. I uh, wholeheartedly agree. It's, uh, there's certainly no major downside to a trial of coming off after two years. And uh, I have to say that many of the patients that have come off and done well are, really think that you're a great doctor. So uh, <laughs> it, is a, it is a good feeling both for you as a physician and the patients. And, when they, and, and if it's somebody who does have a relapse, they go back on and you follow them carefully back on and as, as you mentioned, they go into a deep remission again. So uh, we follow these patients very carefully so that we're not just saying, okay, stop and we'll see you in six months. Uh, you're followed very carefully and we monitor things. And as soon as we detect uh, the, the emergence of the clone again, um, we'll put you back on, you won't have any symptoms. Dr. Mehta, uh, I am in complete remission for seven to eight months uh, with multiple myeloma, and I haven't had a transplant. What are the risks uh, that I have uh, not going through a transplant? Uh, I don't think there are any data that uh, suggest that a transplant is more or less beneficial uh, based upon uh, the level of response an individual has uh, achieved. Uh, I, I think the general statement which is accurate is that when you do a stem cell transplant in a patient with myeloma, you deepen or upgrade the level of the response. You keep the response sustained for a longer period of time and uh, you benefit in terms of survival. So unlike some malignancies which can be cured where you can choose one pathway to cure versus another pathway to cure, for a disease like myeloma which is probably not cured, if you decide to forego a treatment option completely, you are going to sacrifice an element of disease control and survival, which I do not believe can be recaptured with any other alternative. Because the same set of alternatives is available to people who have a transplant and people who do not have a transplant. So if this individual chooses not to have a transplant at all, then they will certainly uh, have a, a compromised survival uh, which could vary from uh, as little as a year to as much as three or four years. Okay, here's a question. Um, so all three of you have certainly uh, managed patients with uh, uh, allogeneic transplant. We did talk about a little bit about the prognosis, but uh, how to handle side effects like graft versus host disease and extreme hyperpigmentation. It's a patient who says that he or she has hyperpigmentation over arms, legs, and face. Is there any help for this? I am so upset how ugly I look. I feel like a monster. Please help me. You can't even cover it with makeup. Um, I mean, I, we do a lot of uh, allergenic transplants and uh, GVHT, particularly uh, GVHT that is cosmetically disfiguring is uh, devastating to a patient's quality of life. Um, uh, there are a number of newer drugs that have become available uh, uh, for graft versus host disease uh, that uh, help the skin, skin changes, uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, so unless they have been explored uh, and they've failed, I would say that there is a, a reasonable chance that uh, you will benefit from appropriate uh, treatment. And again, I would... Uh, talk to the transplant physician who is managing uh, you. And uh, if the transplant center happens to be a, a small one, then uh, seek out uh, uh, another uh, place where you could uh, take an opinion in terms of uh, uh, the drugs that can be used uh, 
Rexolantinib, uh, the drug that we talked about several times for myelofibrosis, a new drug called Resurox, some of the monoclonal antibodies like uh, Rituximab. Uh, uh, there are a number of agents that have been uh, utilized very successfully for, uh, for uh, GVHD, including the hyperpigmentation. So oh, I, I, I would agree. I think, again, the, the emphasis is uh, for those that are having uh, transplants to really focus on early treatment uh, of chronic graft versus host disease so that you can prevent uh, some of the uh, longer term uh, complications. But there are indeed uh, new drugs uh, that are very promising to uh, treat and prevent this. We, up until a few years ago, had no treatments available for chronic graft versus host disease. And We've been doing transplants since 1970, and this year was the first year that we ever had a, a drug available now to treat acute graft versus host disease approved by the FDA. So uh, again, uh, focus on uh, early therapy. Um, if there's still redness in addition to the hyperpigmentation, that means you still have active disease and therapy should be initiated. Obviously, there are complications associated with therapy, including uh, issues uh, related to uh, uh, getting a severe COVID infection. So you have to weigh the risks and the benefits and um, uh, with, with any of these. And like, as we said before, second opinions are not inappropriate for very difficult uh, disease uh, conditions. Uh, we're coming up on uh, finishing here. And so um, not to, uh, not to um, um, be uh, too much like a copycat, we're gonna do, uh, more of a rapid uh, question and answer here. So uh, uh, not to um, channel too much uh, uh, Kramer, um, let's, let's go. And so anybody can answer these. Um, uh, any approved new therapies for Runx1 in AML? No. Okay, I agree with that. There is nothing out there just yet. Doesn't mean that we're working on it. How long from a diagnosis of CLL before starting medication is usually uh, the, the time uh, for that? Yeah, it's typically three to five years. And what would be your indication to start somebody on therapy? If they have changes in their blood counts where their hemoglobin or platelets drop, if the white count's accelerating very quickly, or if they don't feel well, or the lymph nodes are growing, I would start treatment. Life expectancy after MGUS is diagnosis and until treatment is needed for multiple myeloma. Highly variable. Uh, I would say that the typical duration is uh, at least a decade. And I've followed patients for more than 20 years uh, without requiring therapy. My son was diagnosed in September, 2021 with uh, ET with polycythemia. Um, he's uh, was treated with hydroxyurea right from the start, but this gave him awful chest discomfort. Um, that's an unusual side effect that I, unusual side effect. There are other medications that can be used. There's a medication called anagrolide. Um, people, we talk about Jacopi sometimes. We talk about um, interferon, as I mentioned earlier. And yes, myelofibrosis is sometimes seen in this condition, and myelofibrosis can be associated with bone pain. Um, again, I would agree hydroxyurea is something that lowers the white count and platelet count. It doesn't really have any adverse effects on uh, bones, but certainly there are rare complications from any drug. Um, how do you manage uh, side effects of Revlimid, especially uh, GI problems? Um, uh, bowel motility reducing agents, uh, probiotics, cholestyramine, uh, sometimes giving a break, sometimes giving the drug intermittently instead of giving it uh, 10 milligrams seven days a week. We often do 25 milligrams two consecutive days a week and then five days off. That could work and uh, give a trial of uh, stopping the drug. Uh, if the side effects uh, don't disappear, then you know it's not related to revlimid. If the side effects do disappear, then uh, you can uh, uh, either restart the drug at a lower dose, a different schedule, or go to a different drug uh, such as pomalidomide, especially if the side effect is uh, diarrhea. Um, Evushield, are you using it? Which patients uh, are, are getting this? 
And for those uh, uh, online, EvuShield is a monoclonal antibodies that's now FDA approved as a preventative therapy for COVID infections. So uh, at our site, we have a tiered system. So EvuShield is uh, still a little bit limited in terms of how much of it we have, but it can protect people against COVID um, for up to six months uh, for people who can't have a normal immune response to the vaccine. And so in our tier, anybody who is on a B cell or a T cell, uh, you know, depleting treatment. So rituximab, CAR T cell therapy, transplant, um, immune suppressants for other diseases are the first tier. And then second tier would be people who are in remission or not on active therapy that have a number of leukemias and lymphomas. And then third would be solid cancers. I think those tiers and who should get it are, is going to change if the drug becomes more available. Are you accepting patients from other uh, <laughs> um, doctors or community practices? Yeah, as of right now, because of the limitation, we are restricting it to our, our patients who are already established or who come to see us now as for a second opinion or a patient. Um, who is seen at the University of Chicago, but uh, I hope that changes. You know, I hope it's a little bit more widely available soon. I don't know if other institutions are doing the same. So we are not uh, giving it to uh, outside patients, but uh, one interesting thing that we have at least chosen to do in our myeloma and uh, the transplant practice is to uh, monitor the spike protein antibody uh, serially and regularly. And uh, people who have had uh, three doses of the vaccine and still do not have a spike protein antibody uh, automatically have the highest priority to get the drug. You're muted. Oh, uh, sorry. I, 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 we're, we're, um, we take a similar approach. So in the, in the patients who've had B-cell depleting or T cell depleting therapy, we're offering it, but like everywhere else, it's it's um, it's you know very limited what we have. Um, so that that is uh, you know that makes it a little bit tough. I will make one controversial statement, and that is that uh, if a patient does not want the vaccine and wants a shell, I, I would not allow that. <laughs> Uh, quickie, how do I know if the leukemia is the cause of neuropathy in my feet? A broad question, because we don't know exactly what kind of leukemia. Um, the, disease, le, acute leukemias in and of themselves are unlikely to cause um, neuropathy. Some of the treatments we sometimes give can sometimes cause neuropathy, but the disease itself is unlikely to cause neuropathy. And that's different than lymphomas. There are some lymphomas like Waldenstrom's uh, that can cause neuropathy. And, uh, but, but I agree, it's usually the treatment for these cancers that causes it. But again, I think that if somebody is uh, all the clear blue sky has starting to have pain in the feet and the legs and has especially an acute lymphoid leukemia, maybe with active disease, the possibility of meningeal disease needs to be ruled out. And that, that includes doing a spinal tap uh, uh, to check for malignant cells. So for the acute leukemias, as was mentioned, that, that's something that I think would, would be done. Uh, I am on Xanabrutinib. I'm getting hematomas. Is that acceptable? Um, it's unusual with Xanabrutinib to have hematomas. Um, in general, Xanabrutinib and even a Calabrutinib have been engineered to have less effects on platelet dysfunction. Um, but I would say that if there's hematomas, that is worth getting evaluated and potentially changing to a different BTK inhibitor, but that is unusual. I would likely consider a different cause for that. I agree, and things like uh, taking uh, naproxen or um, um, other non-steroidals, uh, somebody who's on blood thinners, uh, somebody who's on Plavix, who had a heart attack, et cetera, uh, that's one of the potential advantages of xanabrutinib is that it doesn't have as much of an mm -hmm. anticoagulant effect as uh, um, abrutinib does. Um, let's see. Um, best treatment for relapse 11Q unmutated CLL with the history of AFib. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's a very good question. So, um, Atrial fibrillation, you know, if it's well controlled, uh, 
may not be as important in the selection, but I will say that both xanabrutinib and acalabrutinib are less likely to aggravate uh, the atrial fibrillation, again, because they've been engineered that way. Um, for the unmutated phenotype, we know that chemotherapy doesn't work. And to be honest, we don't use chemotherapy in the relapse setting anyway anymore. So for that person, um, I would go to either, you know, a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib, um, or to, um, you know, depending on where they are, to venetoclax based therapy or even a CAR T. Last question um, is uh, about diet and uh, something that always comes up. We talked about uh, risk factors at the beginning. We'll end with. Uh, do you have any specific diet recommendations that you give your patients with leukemia and lymphoma? Jayesh, start with you. Uh, I, I, I think uh, data of diet affecting uh, treatment beneficially directly uh, are uh, scarce uh, and in fact close to zero. But a healthier diet will obviously contribute to uh, overall health being good and uh, better overall health will help you to battle the disease better. So I think a healthy diet, a balanced diet is uh, always, always, always gonna be useful. Any specific nutri nutritional supplements? Uh, we don't um, recommend anything other than ensuring that the vitamin D status is repleted, uh, uh, B12 folate supplementation if neuropathy is, uh, is a problem. And of course, multivitamin supplementation in people who are unable to take uh, things uh, uh, appropriately and orally. But uh, as to long list of nutritional supplements that patients often like, uh, I have no evidence to show that those uh, help. Tony, can you hear me? I'm sorry, say that again. Can, can you answer a question? Do you have any specific diet recommendations for your patients or nutritional supplements? Um, I generally recommend just a multivitamin and trying to get most of your vitamins from your diet. So a colorful diet with greens, oranges, and reds is going to be the best way to get uh, all the supplements. You know, vitamin D is something that's being explored in lymphomas, but otherwise there's no specific diet or supplements. Sorry, I was answering the, the question in the chat. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so just to, I, I agree. I think that a well rounded, well balanced diet is good. Sometimes when a patient is neutropenic with um, leukemia, we recommend they stay away from you know, raw meat, sushi, um, and things like that. But, but in general, as a disease fighting approach, um, just a well rounded, well balanced diet is, is the best thing to do. Stay away from the falafel guy on First Avenue there. Oh, <laughs> come on. The, dir the dirty water dogs. The dirty water dogs. <laughs> it improves immunity. <laughs> it probably does, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, a uh, little levity there. Thank, thank you uh, to the um, um, uh, physicians here for giving up your time this afternoon and your very erudite uh, responses to some of these uh, very difficult questions. Thank you all.